Stand Together is proudly sponsored by these International Genetic Solutions Partners. When we collaborate, you profit, achieve results, and build your future with powerful data and informed decisions. Coming up, today's commercial cattle producers rely on the best science to make profitable genetic decisions. International Genetic Solutions offers a powerful answer to that call, bringing leading cattle breeds, businesses, and cutting edge research to the table. Here we discuss targeting the endpoint in an industry that rewards producers who target terminal merit for quality beef and a healthy bottom line. the International Genetic Solutions Targeting the Endpoint Conversation. I'm Chip Kemp with the American Simmental Association and with International Genetic Solutions. There's never been a time in the modern beef business where understanding terminal metrics and ways to add value are more and more important. With me tonight, I'm joined by Dr. Randy Culbertson. She's the lead geneticist for International Genetic Solutions and Mr. Mark Anderson, the executive director of the North American Limousin Foundation. Friends, thank you for being with me. So, Mark, your history in the beef business is unique. Yes, you've spent a lot of time with our friends over at Limousin, but prior to that, you have a tremendous amount of history in the fed cattle space. For those of us who are producers, we hear a lot about these metrics. Frankly, we sometimes don't understand them as much as we could. Make it simple for us. What are the things that add value in the feed yard and the pack and plant that we need to know about? Well, Chip, you're right. Um, you know, look back over the past, the, the biggest thing I see is how much change there is in the cattle business. But one thing that doesn't change is pounds. Pounds are still dollars, regardless of what we're making for breed or kind. But that performance that comes with it, as far as feed conversion, average daily gain tied to dry matter feed conversion, and then even more so today now is the quality of the cow, okay? We heard this morning from cattle facts what a high percentage of cattle are sold on grids now. So. We look at the terminal matrix, as far as the terminal traits go, um, quality and yield grade, you know, total muscle, the ribeye size and cattle. Um, we're seeing bigger and bigger premiums. I mean, wasn't that many years ago, and I think they pointed out this morning, we were grading about 50% choice and we're up around 83 now. So you look at the billion dollars of premiums that are paid almost annually, as they stated this morning, uh, carcass quality and those carcass characteristics combined with performance in pounds to kind of help pay the bills. So in your experience, are there any areas where we have deep holes? We're always getting better on all the traits you described, but have there been any areas that have been a bit of a black box that we just need to dig in and find metrics that maybe we've just not had in the past? Well, I think part of the answer and part of the solution to that, particularly as it relates to the seed stock business to try to get those holes filled, is what you folks are doing at IGS and the breed associations because if there's anything that's tough in the cattle feeding business, gathering those phenotypes like we talk, it's finding cattle that we know the known pedigrees of the sire and the dams. Having those actual phenotypes like you've been able to put together and train the genomic marker panels so we find the winners and losers quicker, you can do it much more rapidly today with those phenotypes that we're gathering. And I'm, you've seen the big increase in carcass data flowing in through IGS from all breeds. So maybe the whole then really has been the fact that while the data exists, as you stated, so much of that data is not tied up in a way where it can be utilized in a genetic evaluation, right? And so as we build those tools, that goes directly into Dr. Randy's wheelhouse as she's been a part of the team that's brought more data on, utilize that data better, it's multi-breed, so it's more robust and more has more utility to a variety of folks. Dr. Culbertson, would you be so kind as to kind of explain, in terms of these terminal traits, how predictive can you be? How much knowledge can you get to offer them when they're making bull selections, when they're looking at EPDs and sale catalogs? How meaningful are these metrics for growth or carcass traits? Well, we're talking about traits, when we talk about growth and carcass traits, these are traits that are moderately to highly heritable. So that means that there's a quite a bit of genetic influence on these traits, as well as an environmental. The more 
carcass traits we get back in, including ultrasound information, all that information's incorporated into the evaluation and we just can do a better and better job and really up the bar when it comes to making genetic decisions because we're providing better genetic tools over time. So Mark, you work with a particular population of, of seed stock operators and they've been aggressively implementing a number of those tools as Dr. Culberson brings out. Can you see within that one subset, that one population, that one small sliver of IGS, what have you seen within that population for some of those important traits? We've been able to make some rapid improvement on our marbling APD, okay? Uh, not only on the purebred population, but back into the hybrids that we make. The advantage we have, because I know when I was running a feed yard, okay, I had all the report card I needed. I had the kill data. I had the feed conversion closeout on the group. Okay. The cool thing about what's happening today with what Randy and y'all are doing, I think you're making those tools for the seed stock producer to identify those individuals because when we started adding a bunch of carcass phenotypes into our kill data, we're blessed to have some, some very fortunate and good cattle feeders and they're data oriented. Um, you see accuracies jump up on bulls right away, two to three tenths, and you can find and identify those cattle that not only excel in quality grade, but still have some of the antagonistic trait characteristics like maintaining ribeye as you increase marbling. So Dr. Culberson, to kind of dovetail off of Mark's comments there, if we make this very tangible for that person who's out buying a bull or looking for a straw a semen, as they're looking at that suite of EPDs, it's human nature. We can say, hey, I need a little more of this particular trait so I can find myself, if I'm not careful, maybe single trait selecting or getting a little too aggressive on one particular EPD. Is there a better strategy for folks if they're looking to add terminal metrics to their particular program? Yeah, I think, you know, the first thing I want to touch on is that single trait selection, although you can make rapid genetic improvement, you can find that you can find yourself kind of in a hole where you've made so much improvement on just one trait that other traits happen to be affected. So what you want to do is take that kind of a, more of a holistic look and look at the whole picture. So how do you make that selection when you have this whole suite of EPDs? And you know, over and over again, we've shown that indexes are the way to go. Whatever that index is, they have economic weights that are specifically designed to weight each one of those traits based on its economic importance. So when you use an economic index, although the genetic selection on an individual trait is, might be slower, over time you're going to be making more genetic improvement towards profitability and not so much on just one single trait because really profitability is taking in multiple traits to be profitable. So the goal is what you just said, not to necessarily have the most of one particular trait short of the most money at the end that we can have, right? Now, Mark, I'm going to guess some of the folks that are watching are going to be like, that's all cool, I appreciate it, but um, my calves get lost at a local sale barn. Nobody really knows what I do and, and, and they can't really track me. You made a comment a little bit earlier and I'd like you to maybe give some realistic uh, understanding to this. Feeders oftentimes have a pretty good understanding of the quality of product that they're buying, even if the source doesn't know it. Could you share with your perspective? Well, no doubt. I mean, you keep record of everything. When cattle come into any feed yard, they're usually put in through a lot system. And when you start, you know, you've got, of course, the traditional pay weights and all the stuff that comes with it in the health papers. But what you do is you keep historical data through there. You keep what ranch they came from. You kind of know the cattle and uh, the area that those cattle came out of and the geographic location. But uh, as you go through most of these yards now, it doesn't matter whether they're a 20,000 head yard or somebody that's involved in trying to fill up a million head of capacity and turn it over twice a year, uh, they keep most of that on file. So within the IGS system, Dr. Culbertson, and you do, you're so involved in terms of piecing together the entire collaborative effort, there are still areas we know that we have to continue to improve, evolve, get better. Are there areas of opportunity from a terminal trade standpoint that you're presently working on within the system that you're excited about that you see coming online down the road? Yeah, so we're currently working on the development of a dry matter intake EPD. You know, that's a trait that's measured in the feedlot, how much feed those animals are consuming. 
So that's a current EPD that we're working on. We're in the initial phases of prototyping it. The other thing that we always work on um, is always how do we improve what we are currently publishing? How do we make improvement to our carcass EPDs? How can we make our growth evaluation better? And we're always trying to explore ways, how can we collect health data that's coming out of those feedlots? And um, that's a big challenge of just how do we get those records and how can we incorporate it into an evaluation. One last comment, as our folks are out buying bulls, they're sourcing genetics, they're buying a straw, a semen, they're looking at those accuracies. And clearly we want as much accuracy in those young bulls as we can get when we're making our buying decisions. One of the tools that you're really starting to see the benefit in the carcass space is the use of genomics, right? Something I know that uh, IGS is incentivizing and working on really hard. Just a quick snippet of how that might impact the, the decision making that the producers uh, forced with on the ground. Right, so when you genotype a bull, and you submit that information into the evaluation, it is the equivalent of about 25 progeny records coming in. So that's huge. It's a, an immense amount of information that we can put into the evaluation on a young animal who doesn't have calves on the ground yet. You know, that genomic information really does, it gives that big boost to accuracy and really helps with that genetic prediction. And, you know, programs also that are genotyping terminal calves as well has also helping lend information to the evaluation and just makes the whole evaluation do a better job of prediction. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for getting to hang with us here in this first segment. We certainly appreciate Mr. Anderson, Dr. Culberson, and they're laying the table on the status and where we need to be headed in terms of terminal metrics in the business. Stay tuned, come right back. We'll hear from Dr. Ken Odie from Kansas State University. Our international genetic solutions discussion continues after this. IGS Stand Together is brought to you by these IGS sponsors. Grow your cattle operation with expert solutions. Neogen's genomic solutions provide insight, mitigating risk, increasing efficiency, and maximizing your herd's potential. Reach your production goals with targeted genomic profiles from Neogen. The American Simmental Association. For genetics that pay, turn to Simmental. The numbers show Simmental and Simmental-influenced calves earn more from packers and auction buyers while offering more efficient females. Stand strong with Simmental and the American Shorthorn Association. The Shorthorn breed is America's breed. For more than 150 years, Shorthorns have served as the definition of maternal excellence, carcass quality, and sustainability. That's performance with purpose. Welcome back. We're here in this segment with Dr. Ken Odie from Kansas State University. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you spending the time. Good to be here. We heard some people you know very well in the last segment kind of set the stage for us a little bit in terms of how we identify terminal metrics, what are some of the holes in the industry, what are some of the challenges we have with finding and, and navigating that data space. You've found a way to navigate that data space just a little bit. You've spent a lot of time in the last many years mining different data sources, um, understanding what different industry partners say about terminal value. The way I would actually describe that is the market signals in feeder cattle marketing have improved, but they're still a long ways from perfect, okay? So what ends up happening is that, that guy that's buying calves, he or whoever's actually gonna own the calves, they're doing the best they can with the information they have to properly price calves. And that has improved, that really has improved, not just at video auction, but in the livestock auction markets as well. We describe cattle much better in auction markets today than we did 30 years ago. 30 years ago, you know, whatever you saw is what you bought. And I give our auction markets a lot of credit because they've worked hard to do a better job of describing those cattle. And hopefully we're doing a better job then of predicting how they perform in the feedlot and how they perform on the rail. So there are clearly a whole host of management pieces that have massive impact on all the conversation that we have. But at the very beginning, folks are making genetic decisions that play a ripple effect through all of the things we're discussing here. So as they're making those genetic decisions, be it AI or bull buying, are you seeing some pieces in this data that start to look meaningful to you? Are there some trends? 
Is it straight bred cattle that have the, the benefit? Are there other sorts of cattle? Are there particular populations that are getting appeal as you're looking at the data sets? There's no doubt in the time period that we have in the Tri-County data, 2002 to 2018, the Angus breed has had a lot of growth and they are clearly the highest marbling breed within our data, okay? But if we look at the continental breeds and particularly look at uh, Simital, Sim Angus, if you want to look at uh, yield grade, if you want to look at fat thickness, uh, and ultimately if you want to look at carcass value, they're a little stronger in carcass value. And that's primarily because carcass weight is such a high value endpoint. And to be real frank, it's why our industry has continued to grow carcass weight. Uh, and we all wonder whether we're going to reach a point out there at some point in time when we've said enough is enough, but we're not seeing that yet. I think I heard you just say that some of the continental sired or continental influenced cattle through that Tri-County data set were actually the ones that garnered the largest check from the packer. Is That's that correct. what I understood? Yep, they were the highest carcass value uh, cattle in the data. So yes. some of the single traits that are exciting and are important in our business, while they have merit and they clearly add value, it's still, we either make money or we don't. And That's it, right, okay. yeah. And you also mentioned the whole cutability component, and it would seem we're destined to make 1,600 pounds the norm well before we go back to 1250, yes. right? This yeah. is what it is. Yeah. Regardless of the viewer's perspective on that, yeah. it just is what it is. And you mentioned something that I found interesting, and that's the ability of some of those continental influence cattle to maintain cutability, and hence probably to the cattle feeder, a bit more marketing flexibility towards their endpoint. Is that an accurate assessment? Yes, and I, I, would, I would make a couple of points. We used to talk a lot about compositional endpoints. I can remember back when we said a steer with four tenths of an inch of fat is ready for slaughter, okay? Well, what's happened is we're not killing many of those anymore. Uh, we're probably much closer to seven tenths of an inch of fat on average than we are to four or five tenths of an inch of fat. So in general, we're killing cattle fatter. What the continental breeds have is they have the capability of going to higher carcass weights without getting quite as fat, okay? Plus, if you think about this, the, the latter part of the feeding period is the least efficient from a feed efficiency perspective. If you think about it this way, the genetics that have the capability to go to these very heavy carcass weights uh, should be the higher value genetics, and I think they, they are in, to a degree today, but I anticipate that'll be more so in the future. The other point that I would make in that um, is if you think about the fact that steers have greater capability to go to heavier carcass weights than heifers do, we're seeing that now devalue heifers in the marketplace. So it would seem that because we're crossbreeding, we're keeping those cattle maybe a little longer, as you say, from a fat standpoint, but we're adding some thriftiness potentially from the crossbreeding, some healthfulness. We know that there are some physical challenges of some of these cattle as they get to those heavy weights, right? We all we know the conversation of some of the heart failure issues. Clearly there's a strong genetic component, but you can't ignore the fact that a lot of these cattle are carrying levels of condition that we didn't do 25 years ago, right? So my question is, it's one thing for folks at our level to talk about, well, let's identify these problems, let's identify ways to work around it. But if I'm the guy breeding cattle this year, or if I'm the lady making bull decisions this year, that's all well and good. I don't have time for you all to figure this out. Are there any tangible steps that they can take today to help avoid some of those health issues in the feed yard later on? Or are they at our mercy? Their terminal sired calves are gonna have greater capabilities to hit these high carcass weights at a reasonable composition. Interesting conversation, one that I think we might get into more in our next segment. With that, I say thank you to Dr. Ken Odie. I appreciate your time. We appreciate everything you do for all of us in general. And again, I encourage you to come right back with us in a few moments. We'll expand on that last conversation he had. Our international genetic solutions discussion continues after this. IGS Stand Together is made possible by these sponsors. Bronvi Association of America. Bronvi genetics are proven among commercial cow-calf operations. Expect high carcass yields, correct structure, and unparalleled maternal traits. When profit matters, Bronvi is the answer.
North American Limousine Foundation. Do more with less with Limousine. Incorporate Limousine and LimFlex genetics into your program to capitalize on the breed's feed efficiency while earning carcass premiums. Limousine today, profit tomorrow. And the American Gelvy Association. Gelvy and Balancer genetics offer increased fertility, longevity in pounds, as well as gain, grade, and value in the feed yard. Gelvy and Balancer, the smart, reliable, and profitable choice. Welcome back to our Targeting the Endpoint episode. I'm here with Mr. Jamie Dale, a cattleman from North Carolina. Mr. Dale, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Chip. So we're out this last couple segments. We've heard a lot from folks talking about the power of data, the utility of data to identify terminal metrics in cattle. Um, we've heard a lot of folks talk about the opportunities of doing even more and greater things with that. You actually have to put these things in place. You actually have to make them happen. Could you just give a brief description of what you and your family do back in North Carolina? We're a 500 head cow calf operation. We, we keep 100 replacement heifers a year that we'll put back in or, or sell replacements out of. And then the, the balance of the cattle that don't merit being replacements? We're, we're going, to, we've been feeding them in Holdridge. Okay. Um, and sell it on the grid. Okay. And so I know a lot of the folks that are listening, um, that's a bold step, right? Retaining ownership can be a little intimidating. It sounds like it, but it's really not as bold as you might think once you know all the variables. I mean, you can retain as much or as little as you care to do. I mean, you do not have to take all the risk. The feed yards will work with you. I mean, they'll own 50% or you know as little as 25%. Um, you, you do not have to wait the whole time in order to get your money. You can have a small amount invested there and still be able to get your data back to know what your cattle are doing. So you just said something that's really important. So many of us say, we want to know the terminal metrics of our cattle, right? But if you don't have ownership at that point, you're not going to get that data. How is that data flow starting to change and inform your decisions? Let's just say you had 25% that you retained ownership in. You're still going to receive your data. And that data is the only way you know how your genetic decisions have been put into play and what they're doing. So you're getting full data from the feed yard. You're getting uh, the full report in terms of carcass merit from the plant. How what kind of decisions does that allow you to make that you couldn't make three or four years ago back home? Well, you can take what you find out on that carcass data and, and use it in your genetic selection to know an area that you may be need improvement. I was actually shocked that our, what our ribeye size came back when we were just moderate ribeye uh, genetics. Speaking of your genetics, so when, when you go to your various seed stock suppliers and you're aggressively seeking bulls that can meet your needs. What are some of the primary genetic tools in the EPD index suite? What are the things that you're looking at? I like to stay with the all-purpose index. That keeps me in the middle of the road. I like moderate. I don't like to trace, chase one, one trade or another. As long as we're in the top 25, 30%, that API index will give me maternal for my replacement heifers, as well as carcass traits for my slaughter animals. So that whole life cycle metric, it just simply is the index that fits your business model, right? Correct. Because you are making a lot of high-end females plus needing terminal metrics. And so while some might say, well, you're a cattle feeder, so you're all terminal index all the time, but in fact, that would be working against the heifer side of your equation. Correct. I, I, I do not want to get added frame size or get too much frame size because then I create another problem in my replacements. So. That's another really interesting point because you're looking to seek a moderate female, but you and I know pounds sell in a, at the end, right? So how have you seen your outweights on calves? Where has that looked at? 1550 on steers, 1375 to 1400 on heifers. That moderate frame, you can still put meat on. Ah, so now, so I, I think that's interesting, Jamie, because a lot of times we might think making that moderate female means my calf is going to tap out. And it might if it were a straight bred animal, right? Correct. We might not have the latitude, but if I'm not mistaken, you have some strategies in place from a management standpoint, in particular in terms of responsible crossbreeding that allows you to keep cow size depressed, but still push on the other side. Is that true? 1,400 pound 
you know, Mama Cow is, is, is plenty big in, in our part of the country. Yep. yep. And that's about probably the top end of what I would want them to be. Okay. But when you put the bulls on them, and those steers, I mean, they're still going to be a five eight frame. Yep. And but they still finish out in that heavy 15, 15, 50, and still perform as far as the uh, quality grade. Those who are, are hearing about your experience in the feedlot sector, many are gonna ask the very straightforward, simple question. If I wanted to try to taste just a little bit of cattle feeding with a portion of my program, how do I even start? Who do I call? How do I move this ball forward? I would find a reputable feeder and contact him. And with all, you're gonna to have to have a pin. I mean, some of them are half a truck load, you may find one but you predominantly need something that's gonna be 60 head. So if I only wanted to sample what I had, I would get some neighbors, somebody I thought had like kind genetics, same size cattle, and, and see if we could put them in a pen together. My final question for you, Jamie, is as you look at the arc of your family's business, it's out into the future a little bit, do you envision this, this balance of maximizing terminal merit by feeding the cattle and still maximizing value on the heifer side as replacements. Is, is that kind of the intent for your operation going forward? Do you see any big changes? Well, I, I see maintaining or keeping our heifer developed, either while selling feeder cattle or feeding our feeder cattle, but you don't have to do all or, or one. Yeah. You can split that, split your risk, get your information, and it kind of spreads out the risk of everything. So essentially, you're telling that young couple out there, that 30-year-old couple who's just crazy enough to want to do this for a living, have a little diversification in play, right? Be a little bit nimble. Um, don't necessarily put all your eggs in one basket, but also don't be scared to, and, to put your toe in the water. And, and find that feed yard that says, yes, I'll partner with you on them kids. So you've worked very hard to identify seed stock operators who meet your needs. And those are operators who are thoughtful, they're engaged in the business, they can give you direction. What encouragement would you give to that producer who's maybe not confident their seed stock operators may be taking them in the right direction? What should they be thinking about? What should they be willing to do? Ask as he feed his cattle. What does he do with his with the steer calves that do not make bows? See if he's putting his money where his see, mouth is. See if he's putting his money where his mouth is. Thank you, Mr. Dale. And thank you all for spending time with us, listening to the various voices on this episode of Targeting the Endpoint. Should you have any more uh, questions, comments, thoughts, or you'd like to reach out to us, you can find us at internationalgeneticsolutions.com. Stand Together was brought to you by these IGS partners. Visit them online or at internationalgeneticsolutions.com to learn more.